morning. As I see a lot of friends and people out here in the audience, and probably anyone else would rather come up here and stand here than me. Uh, okay. Uh, I wasn't sure why they asked me to come, actually, um, when I said, why did you choose me for the panel? Because you answered the phone. <laughs> I still pick up my phone and answer it. <laughs> anyway, my name is Rita Zimmer, and um, I run an organization called Housing Plus Solutions, and we work with women and families here in mostly in Brooklyn and uh, scattered site as well as some congregate facilities. And we uh, make every effort to embrace a housing first model. But I want to go back to kind of how I got into it and how it got started and uh, dating myself somewhat, but uh, this is the late 70s. Um, I had just graduated from, I got a master's degree in public health, I got a job. Uh, with the, an agency, a wonderful group called the BRC, the Bowery Residence Committee. It was only itself an agency about five years old at the time, maybe. I wasn't even maybe that old. I was hired to come in and I was going to open up this sobering up station. That's what it was called. We were going to take people from the street and bring them into this facility, keep them for a certain period of time. And it came right after, and for some of you again who remember, maybe Kevin and some of my panelists do, uh, in 1976, I think, New York State decriminalized public intoxication. And that really was what led to a lot of those programs starting because people, when they were publicly intoxicated, got picked up and got sent to jail. And jails were by, in de facto, the sobering up stations, so to speak you know, drying out, and then they would let them back out and they get picked up again, and so that was my job. And, but what I didn't realize is that when I, when they opened the door, it was an empty room. It was an empty floor. It was about 3,000, 4,000 square feet, and my job actually was to set it up and to renovate it and then to open up this program. And so, I thought, oh my gosh, you know, I was, uh, I won't tell you how old I was, very young though. Um, <laughs> And all I can think of is, and I knew who the population was going to be. It was going to be men from the Bowery living in, on, on, the, on the Bowery, Skid Row, whatever you want to call it. And I thought the only thing I could think is, I've got to make it look like a home. I've got to make it feel like a home. Because our job was to get the men to come into our program, stay, get sobered up, get feeling better, and hopefully we can move them on to some kind of a program. And so that's what I actually set out to do, was create a home. And so, uh, and so I set it up, and we had, although we had dorms, and we had, uh, and that's what I did for about, it took me about eight, ten months to get the program renovated. And um, uh, I used to, and the men would come in, and they really couldn't quite believe that this was where they were going to be for the next few days. And what we discovered, that by making it feel like a home, they started to act like it was their home. They, in fact, started to, instead of coming to the dinner table, because we had a dinner table with round, I insisted on having round tables, I put checkered tablecloths on the tables, Thursday night was Italian night, we had candles. Um, they started to come to the, to the dining, to food, dressed. They would take off their robes and their slippers, and they would actually start asking us, gee, do you have some, you know, can I go back into the clothing room and can I find something that would make, you know, a, a clean shirt or something? And so that was some of my early lessons about embracing a housing first kind of a model, that if you start to make a home, people will start to, they'll start to act, they'll start to act differently, they'll start to they'll feel differently. And as they feel differently, hopefully they'll start to act differently. That was one of my early lessons. Then I was asked by a good friend of mine and a colleague named Danny Cronenfeld. If anyone who knows Danny Cronenfeld from Henry Street Settlement House, he was the executive director then. This is in the 80s, and uh, I had just started a group called Women in Need. And um, Danny asked me to come down and do some training because there was uh, not much training being done for people who are homeless providers. There was a lot of shelters opening and a lot of the staff really didn't know kind of like how to handle, you know, what to do with homeless individuals and families. So I came down and did a training and I'm going to do a little bit of what I did that day here. Um, I said to the group, we had a big blackboard and I said, let's list all the staff that are in a typical shelter. The staff, you, who are you? There was social workers and psychologists in the room and there was a psychiatrist and there was a whole bunch of mostly counseling staff. And I said, 
list in order who you think, when a client comes in the door, a homeless person, who do you think they should see first? <laughs> Well, they should see the social worker, they should see the psychiatrist, they should see the doctor, and they should see the book, you know, the occupational therapist. So that was the list. One, two, three, four. Just think that's what I'm going to say. Social worker, doctor, psychiatrist, occupational therapist. And I said, okay, let's take a break. Now, let's say that you just became homeless. And you just walked in the door of this new shelter. Who do you want to see first? I want to see the housing person. <laughs> Who do you want to see next? I want to see my attorney. <laughs> oh. Who do you want to see next? I want to see the employment specialist. Oh. Who do you want to see? And then I finally want to see the social worker. <laughs> so just ask yourself that question. If you were in the situation that we find our tenants, what would you want first? I think it's usually a pretty clear answer. We'd want housing first. And how many of you, I've worked in the treatment field for a long, long time, how many of you have heard a tenant, and I think it's important we call them tenants, they're not clients, they're not patients, they're tenants, and the language we use is really important. Um, how many of you have heard someone say, oh, when I get my housing, then I'll do that. I'll get a job. When I get my housing, right? Look, oh, the heads are going. Come on, keep those heads going, right? When I get my housing, I'll go to self-help groups. When I get my housing, it's okay. I think it's really pretty clear. I think we say, you know, tenant choice, client choice. It's housing, and I think if we can start to just think about that in a different way and look at the language that we use, that really as we start to approach it, I'm just, my job here is just to kind of give you some of these little clues because I think there's some real expertise here and we hope that we'll spend and less time talking and more time having dialogue with you. But I guess that was one thing, one of my early lessons. And um, we found that people are more likely to address their issues if they're housed. Um, I'm also going to talk a little bit about families because I think that's uh, maybe a different area. Uh, because when you're talking about families, you're talking about children. And I'm also thinking one of the other areas we need to spend some time talking about is some real practical issues when you do housing first. Are you going to have more problems in the apartment, keeping them maintained? You know, are there, there going to be things breaking more often? So it's not just about what the person is. It's really, you have to really want to look at the whole picture and look at just the, what's the practical aspect. Are we looking at housing that's near subway stations? Are we looking at housing that's got access to uh, uh, services in the neighborhood, in the community? Are we looking at housing that are near churches? Um, um, uh, those are some of the things I think when we just look at siting and if we can, certainly in certain communities it's a lot more difficult. Um, um, and also I think we have to stop looking at how do we measure success. Sometimes in the treatment field, and I've been in the treatment field from uh, my first job ever was as an alcoholism counselor in the um, John Norris Clinic in Rochester, New York. Anyone who knows upstate New York. I was an alcoholism counselor. And, um, and it was always important, we would have meetings, self-help meetings, like this could be a really great AA meeting here. The size is perfect, you know, and uh, people are nodding off. <laughs> anyway, uh, everybody would like to be in the back of the room. Anyway, um, but um, in treatment, you know, we always used to measure success by counting your days. Right? And I think we have to stop doing some of those things. You know, that's not success necessarily. Some, but I've met many people in recovery for 20, 25 years who are really jerks. You know, and they're not very nice either <laughs> sometimes. And I've met people in early recovery who are the most magnificent people. People with three and four months sobriety have so much compassion. And so I think that we have to be able to rethink some of the ways in which we define success. And so oftentimes we've gotten used to counting, counting days, counting years, counting this, counting what, you know, how much money you're making. And so I think that's some of the things I'm just trying to shake up the group a little tiny bit. Um, uh, one of the things that we discovered in this sobering up station, as we talked about, is that we weren't, people were not going to the emergency rooms as often. Um, they were coming into our place a lot. They, in fact, sometimes they'd be gone for three or four weeks and then they'd be back again. Sometimes only eight or nine days. And people said, oh, this is awful. We're not being successful. I said, yes, but he's coming sooner. He's not waiting to get so sick. Mm -hmm. 
before he comes here. So maybe that's really a success. And so we started to see that that was a success. It wasn't our failure. That he started to see us as a place to come when things were not going so well. And maybe he got then four, five, six months. Maybe he didn't have his bad ulcerated legs. Maybe he, we were able to get to his TB sooner. Maybe we were able to get the, you know, the, get the diabetes in hand. Uh, and so I think that there's a lot of different ways that we look at success, and I think that's important. And that um, motivation, uh, that's our job, I think is to help people get motivated and to help them stay motivated. I mean, it used to be the criteria, you know, are, is this person motivated? Oh, a lot of people aren't motivated. They're coming there because they have to, you know, but you hope that once they get there that maybe our job is to help to motivate them some. Um, the, um, I'm reminded, I'll just tell you again a little bit about families, and I think I've probably uh, blown my, my time here. Um, and I think with Housing First, um, when we're working with families, we have children. And so, uh, and that relapse is part of the definition of the disease. And so if we think that relapse is not gonna happen, we're fooling ourselves, you know? And yet, when relapse happens, you know, what are we gonna do when there's a family? And if the housing is stable for the children and for the family. We have, uh, we have about 30 families now in some of our housing in Brooklyn. Uh, some of it's scattered sites, some it's congregate. We've had some families living with us for seven years now. And yes, they've had relapses over the period of time. They've had periods of time when they didn't pay the rent. You know, that, that's a problem. And um, they've had times when I, walking down the street talking to a tenant and she was on her way to pay the cable bill. And I said, well, how about the rent? <laughs> so, Miss Rita. <laughs> and so I said, well, let me look at your cable bill. And so I looked at the cable bill, and she had a cable box in every one of the bedrooms. She had three children who she'd been reunited with after not living with them for about four years. And their grandmother, when they moved into this apartment with us, bought a TV for each one of the children, the grandchildren. So she had to go get a cable box for each one. So she had a cable bill, you know, one of those three for three, you know, the three for one or whatever you call them, you know, you get, she didn't even have a computer. But, and her cable bill was like 190 something dollars. You know, and, but she said, but Miss Rita, you know, I haven't had my kids for four years. And her oldest son was 16, had been in a group home and he was so angry and he was so furious. And so the lesson was, okay, you know, maybe we can get down to three. You know, let, you know, let's go from a cable box and every, well, by the end of a year, she had only one cable box in the living room. And they're all watching TV in the living room. But she had to have that period of time. And we had to chase her for the rent all the time because she had to pay the cable bill first. And once we realized that and we kind of put ourselves into her shoes, we could say, okay, all right, but can we get the cable, you know, and so gradually we worked at it. So you have to kind of start again, it's all the principles we know starting where the person is. And that's the same, the same principle for housing first. Start where they are and then we'll kind of find our way. And we will find our way because we're good at what we do. So um, I don't think I have anything much else to say other than I hope you have some dialogue and a chance to hear from some of you. And uh, I hope that you'll give it a try if you aren't doing, how many of you are doing housing first? I don't think we asked that question. So we've got a really good group of experts here in the room. So I think that's what we really ought to, we ought to stop talking and start to have some dialogue and hear from you what are some of the things that work for you. And if you haven't tried it, then buddy up with somebody here who is doing it and start to see what will it take to change the culture, to do some of the practical things. Is it gonna be more maintenance cost? Are you gonna to have to have some emergency